Well, I'm Charles, and I'm using AI to detect cancer. So currently, a tumor discovery is in my pathologists who look over millions of cells for hours in order to find the tumors. When they look over something like this right here, this purple image on the left is actually a pathology tile, and they find the tumors which are actually uh, shown by this annotation over here. This is we're here where white is a tumor and black is non-tumor. So I wanted to make a model that could do this. I wanted to take a tile of a pathology slide and turn that into a useful annotation for a pathologist. So first I'm gonna show you two alternative models which I built myself and I'm gonna compare them. And then I'm gonna show you how well they worked, try and quantify that. And finally I will show you how you can add small perturbations to their inputs to make them say different things. So here's the basic setup of my models. So first, uh, first I have a compressor, which is usually an autoencoder, neural network. And then I run the compressed version of the image. So the image goes in, gets compressed. I run that into a classifier, convolutional neural network I made myself. And that is turned into a cancer heat map. And the only thing I'm gonna change is going to be the compressor type. So it's either gonna be a sparse coding autoencoder compressor or a deep denoising autoencoder compressor. So sparse coding is a special kind of machine learning which uses an overcomplete dictionary and LCA. And it's overcomplete, so that means that it's actually getting larger in each layer, but it uses LCA, which means it's enforcing sparsity. And so the number of activations in each layer dwindles and gets smaller and smaller, um, reducing your information content. And the a deep learning uh, approach uses an, over, an undercomplete dictionary and uh, dimensional reductions, which means each layer gets smaller and smaller. Um, and therefore, it reduces the amount of data you have to store. That's for compression. So these are both methods of compression. So an autoencoder uh, is, this is a type of neural network which takes in an image, say, and then compresses it down to a lower dimensional representation called the latent representation, and then decompresses that into the original image. And then tries to make these two, the re reconstruction and the original image uh, match and it learns a pattern in doing so. That's how it learns a pattern in the data. And also it learns how to compress the data. So it's very useful for compression. So I built a couple different autoencoders. I built uh, two for both my models. Uh, this is a deep denoising autoencoder. So it takes in noisy images of, of pathology slide tiles, and then it denoises them to look less noisy. Um, and so, uh, this is, and so you can tell here, it's doing, it's doing a really good job. It's just actually preserving details really well. In fact, here's the same image without noise on it. So you can tell um, the information is actually very well preserved across the compression, across the bottleneck of the autoencoder. Here's a, a similar output from the sparse autoencoder. So I put in this image and I got a very nice reconstruction on the image. A lot of the details are really well preserved in that, in that out output. So now I have two autoencoders and I want to make I want to make uh, cancer heat map predictions from these uh, compressions. So I need some labels for that. And the way I, well, I got those from a, uh, some actual pathologists, they went in and they drew these circles around the uh, tumors. So red means a tumor and green means a non-tumorous region within that area. And then I took those and I made them into masks. So I, I turned the uh, tumorous area to be white and the non-tumorous area to be black. So here's that mask I made. So you can tell that it matches the shape perfectly. In fact, you can see up here, this uh, island right here is correctly identified. And next I'm gonna show you my deep models predictions for this slide. So here's some of my models predictions for this slide. So you can tell this uh, looks pretty good. It's actually matching the, the ground truth very well. Um, and, and next is the sparse model prediction. So also, again, it's matching the predictions very well. Um, so both models are doing really good. They're doing pretty much equally good, it looks like. But how do you quantify what good means? Well, in the medical field, they actually use something called ROC or receiver operating characteristics to determine what, what's really good. And uh, that basically tells you a, 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 a trade-off between over-predicting tumor and over-predicting non-tumors. So here's two ROC curves I built for my models. And basically all I need to understand is that to the ex extent that the area beneath this curve is less than one, you're making mistakes. Uh, and so you can tell I am making some mistakes, but overall I'm doing a pretty good job. Also, they're almost exactly the same area under the curve. So 84 and 85%, they're, they're very, doing very, they're really neck and neck. They're really matched well. And they're doing, a, also they're doing a very decent job. Um, 
But here's the catch. Deep learning is a black box algorithm. You can't tell how a deep learning algorithm gets from A to B. And so, but un, un, unfortunately for us, the FDA does not allow black box algorithms for use in the medical field. Um, but of course, and, and so here's why deep learning is such a, has a flaw. And this is a state of the art image classifier, not made by me, but made by somebody else. And it, it classifies macaws and bookcases. So if you fed this image of a macaw, it would say it's a macaw. But then if you add this noise to the macaw, you get a bookcase. This is not a bookcase, but it, the, the uh, machine believes it's a bookcase because of the small noise we added to it. Uh, so that's pretty bad because what if this was a tumor and you added like a lens, uh, lens glare, so a little bit of a, a staining difference, and you get a non-tumor. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Here's another example. This is, a, of course, a stop sign. We can tell. All right. Um, but then you add this point looking pattern right here, and you get a maximum speed 100. Which if you're Tesla, that'd be very bad. Um, so now I'm going to check my deep model. And so here's the original slide. Here's the attack. So there's a tiny difference. You can barely even see the difference. Um, and if you, I, and I would say that if you were a pathologist, you probably couldn't wouldn't even notice this either, because uh, well, it's just a one percent change on the image. Um, and here's the my deep model's original prediction. So no perturbation, no adversarial example added. Here's after I added the one percent change to the image. So it basically flipped where it was saying tumor was, and now it has a white where it should be black and black where it should be white. So it's basically inverted itself. And to ma now you're basically removing the human from the tumor, which is not good for the human. Um, and here's the sparse model's predictions. So this is the sparse model's original predictions. Here's after one percent perturbation. Basically no change. It, there was almost no difference in its actual meaningful predictions after a, a tiny change, which doesn't even make sense to a human. So that's a really good result right there. And again, we saw the deep model completely failed. Sparse model, not really, no, didn't really notice the difference. Um, so next I wanted to know what is actually going to fool the sparse model? Because if I can make an image that fools the sparse model, I might be able, be able to understand what features it's using to make classifications. So I upped my uh, adversarial example to be 15% of perturbation on the image. So here's the full 15% perturbation. Here's the original image. So this time you can, actually, you can actually see the difference between the two images. It's a pretty large change to the image. And here's the sparse model's predictions. So uh, it kind of failed uh, gracefully. It, it, uh, it's not really too confident anything is tumor, but it was still gonna be useful to the pathologist in a way. Now here's the deep model's predictions. It just, it failed utterly. It just says, this is most definitely cancer. This is most definitely not cancer. And we know it's definitely wrong. Um, so we, we saw that the source model held up pretty well. Um, and the deep model is, uh, was decimated by the 50% uh, perturbation and 1% perturbation. So uh, what actually happened? Though? Why did the source model get confused? Well, here's a zoomed in tile of the zero, no perturbation at all. So the original image. And here's a 15% perturbation. Um, and what you notice is if you look over here, kind of right here where this arrow is pointing, uh, there's actually an addition of new dots, new polka dots, which those kind of look like they could be nucleuses in actual cells. Meaning that it, you're actually adding a meaningful feature to the image here, you're kind of like painting a bookcase over a macaw. You're actually changing the stop sign from a, from a stop sign to a 100 miles per hour sign. So uh, it actually is changing the image enough to the point where it's, it would fool a pathologist. Um, so yeah, we saw that when we added meaningful features to the image, it actually did fool both models, which makes sense because you're actually changing the image, the meaning of the image. So I already showed you some ROC curves for, for both of my models earlier when I, before I attacked them. But this is actually after I attacked them. So uh, the blue here is the original without attack. And each other color represents either 1, 10, or 15% uh, of the perturbation I added. So the source model holds up pretty well. But as soon as we get to some meaningful features, it actually gets kind of, kind of, kind of confused. And the uh, deep model is immediately uh, confused by the uh, perturbations. And 
of course, ROC I only used because it's used in the medical field and because other people used it who also did the same task. But there's actually very few cancer data points in my, my entire data set. So uh, it's actually better to use a PR curve, which is better for accounting in highly unbalanced data sets. Um, and we see the same thing here. Uh, D models completely obliterated. Um, so I saw that uh, with original images, they, were th they did the same job. They were equally as great. Although when I added a 1% perturbation, the deep model was immediately uh, blown out of the water. And the, spar and the sparse model was like, yeah, I understand it. Um, and the, um, but then when I added a meaningful change to the image, both models were confused because it was actually like putting a, a bookcase over a parrot. Um, so now I actually, I actually ma made a um, explainable machine learning model, which can be now be used in the medical field. Uh, uh, for, for a doctor, because it's, it's no longer a black box algorithm. And one thing I want to add is that my first uh, iterations, were, which were around uh, Herbert's first iterations, which were around 80%. Uh, the next step for this product would probably be, be to uh, make an interface for a pathologist to actually process their slides and hopefully give them a very useful uh, validation or like a second pair of eyes uh, for their uh, for for their own annotations to somebody's uh, uh, pathology, and also I was recently given some even bigger computers to run my 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 uh, neural networks on because uh, before now I I was using a small tile so I had actually taken my taken my entire image and I broken it up into very small pieces like a puzzle piece puzzle pieces and um, I had been I had been processing each piece like it was its own data point. But we can actually, and that was because I only had so many, so many, uh, so much RAM. But now I've been given even larger computers, computers with like uh, eight T4 GPUs. Uh, so I'm gonna try and do full slide uh, 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 processing with those. So now I'm gonna show you some of my code. This is uh, some code for the encoder, which is part of the auto encoder, for the, deep, for the deep auto encoder. So. The autoencoder consists of an encoder and decoder. So the encoder just takes something and it presses it down. And so uh, this, this is, I, I built it in a very object-oriented fashion and you can see is uh, for this, the encoder, all we have is three layers. And I'll, what I specified in the layers is the number of features in the layers, how big the layer should be, a couple of other things I can go through if you want me to. Um, and then later on, TensorFlow actually calls this for me and it calls my function, which I define here, and this is sets up my entire model. So this just puts all my layers together and also adds in things like dropout and max pooling uh, to in between them. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically how you set up any part of the neural network. This is very similar code to the decoder and the classifier. This is my code for the, the actual attacking. So the make generation of adversarial examples. So uh, it goes through and it, it creates a small perturbation and it does this 15 times. And it tries to, the perturbation it finds it actually back up gets through and, and uh, it optimizes it, optimizes it to, uh, to actually make the loss in increase and, uh, and does this 15 times, optimizes, and optimizes the image and saves it out. I can go through this one if you want. Um, so I actually wrote over 4,000 lines of code for this project uh, in Python, Bash, and Perl. And the data I got was actually collected um, from, some, uh, from a hospital in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and and, and uh, I also ha I also want to thank my mentor uh, Garrett Kenyon who sponsored me on this project for two years now. Well, one year for this project, but he's been with me for two years. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Charlie. All right, judges, the floor is open for questions. So, Charlie, this is Dave Janicki. Um, I'm interested in the approach to noise generation. It sounded like when you were talking about the code that you were adding to the file a random amount. Um, have you tried to look at uh, what I would consider to be maybe a, a, a more pathological amount of noise that might be due to differential staining or differential thickness of the slides or other sorts of aspects that, that would be physically reasonable as opposed to just noise. 
So you mean like noise uh, sampled from actual pathology slides? Real? Or what you might expect from an actual pathology slide. Oh. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't think of that. Um, but for my examples, I wanted to show that I could get rid of useless information. So an autoencoder, when it compresses, when it compresses the slide, it, it learns to actually remove the uh, the meaningless information, such as noise, right here. So when I'm when I'm adding noise here, so I'm actually kind of proving that when you add noise to it, it, it can easily understand the uh, data within it. But when you add this special noise to it, it completely obliterates uh, its capacity to. It. So um, I didn't really add noise specific to uh, pathology because I was I was actually, I was just trying to prove that it can. Uh, that it can deal with noise, but not with specific kinds of noise. Okay. Generally noise, special Yeah, noise. Because, because very often when we look at uh, pathology slides or, or radiographs or things like that, different people have different visual acuity and different preparers of these materials do various, <laughs> very well. You can imagine some guy late on Friday when he wants to go home and he's slicing one of these slides, he doesn't slice it quite flat um, or stain it quite well. So those are the things that very much bother the medical or, or the professionals in all sorts of different fields. And so it, it'd be interesting to um, try to, to elicit some other sorts of noise, um, which is a little bit different from, you know, sort of um, spoofing an image like the stop sign or the macaw. Yeah. You know, there, um, yeah. There are so, various things that are real problems for the pathologist. Yeah. So making it more robust to like uh, noise kinds of uh, augmentations you would see in the wild. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, hopefully, adding some kind of noise actually will make it more robust in some way to those kinds of changes. Um. But yeah, I didn't do that. So I could, I could definitely, uh, uh probably improve this by uh, by by trying to sample some kind of pathology related noise. Yeah, so, and you know, there are pathologists in almost any hospital, so uh, I'm sure that in town you could, uh, you could find somebody to talk to about, you know, what Yeah, no, actually, I was thinking recently about, I, I kind of want to get in touch with one, because I want to see if they could actually use this, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Go down to, uh, you know, the teaching hospital in Albuquerque, and they'll have a lot of interesting uh, things to bounce off of you. So this is uh, Stephen Garen. Could you just <clears throat> review um, when you're dealing with the features how you're, it's no longer a black box. Just kind of restate that kind of uh, claim. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so sparse coding when it has um has um an overcomplete dictionary, which means well. So in in deep learning you have a a very limited dictionary. You have fewer and fewer. Your your the size of your layer goes down as you go down in the uh, as your network goes on. And um, and so it actually reuses features. Um, but sparse coding, you have extra features. You have more features than you actually need, and you're using sparsity to make it to force it to reduce the number of active neurons each time. Um, and and so in sparse coding, you can kind of trace one neuron through instead of having all these neurons that are kind of on. So if you had one neuron that, like, let's say a neuron that represents uh, my shirt, my white shirt, right here, so this patch right here. Mm -hmm. But also another neuron that represents right here. So they're both like white patches, right? But they're different. They're, they're, they're semantically different kinds of pieces. So this is a shirt. This is a wall. Mm -hmm. so those are totally, they should really have different neurons to represent them, right? That's why um, sparse coding, you have extra neurons, which are not always active. So would you be able to show in your example how your coding is not a black box then? Uh, yeah. So um, if I, well, so what I showed was, that you can make a deep idea, a deep uh, adversarial example to the deep deep model, and that 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 example does not work on the uh, sparse model, um, which kind of kind of shows it because it's not being fooled by meaningless changes to the image, um, uh, but also uh, because it has it has a lot more features in it, you'd hopefully go through and actually trace the uh, neurons that are active and hopefully understand mm -hmm. that too. Right? Are you able to do that on yours? That's kind of what I'm getting at. Uh, so I have not tried. Um, I've not I'm done sorry? that. I've okay. not done that, though. No. That'd be cool. Yeah.
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Judges, anyone else? So Charlie, explain to me your relationship with your two co-authors on your paper, please. Okay, so I'll start with uh, Austin Thresher. Austin Thresher uh, made the sparse dictionary, which I used. So I built the entirety of the deep model, uh, the classifier, the autoencoder, and I even built the sparse classifier, but I did not build the uh, sparse dictionary, which was used in the sparse uh, model. And so he, he built that. Um, and then uh, Dr. Kenyon is actually my, my mentor. Um, and he also, uh, and uh, so he helped me a lot with a lot. Of, he helped me with figuring out how to, how to analyze my product and what kinds of, uh, uh, how to structure it really. Um, uh, does, does that answer your question or should I uh, keep on going? How did you come about this this particular topic, and and when did this topic start? So it it I uh, I this started actually last beginning of last summer. So I came to work for, for Garrett Kenning at the beginning of last summer. I actually had worked with him before the, the previous summer, um, and he actually had, he just had the product um he had the product going on, so he invited me onto it, and I took it over and um. Uh, and then I, I continued working it from the beginning of last summer until now. So essentially this project was assigned to you? Oh, uh, well, I was given the option of a couple of projects, but this, I chose this one. Okay. So about how many hours a week have you invested into this project, especially over the summer months? So over the school months, it was around 12 to 20 hours a week. Over the, uh, the summer months, it was around 30 on average. Okay. All right. Judges, anyone have any additional questions? Thanks, Charles. Thank you. Going once, going twice. All right, Charlie, thank you very much. Thank you guys. I'll get off, I guess. Is that All right, see you guys. Yeah.